Right, so let's welcome Dr. Theo Fijo Haridas, who joined Florida's Nova Southeastern University July 1st as professor at the Institute of Neuroimmune Medicine and director of a new center of excellence on neuroinflammation research. He's been professor of pharmacology and internal medicine and director of molecular immunopharmacology and drug discovery through Tufts School of Medicine and will remain as adjunct professor there. He received his BA, Master's, Master's of Philosophy, PhD, and MD from Yale. He trained in internal medicine at New England Medical Center and received the Oliver Smith Award recognizing excellence, compassion, and service. He has over 475 publications with over 42,000 citations, placing him in the world's top 2% of most cited authors, and he is the most top-rated expert on mast cells by Expertscape. He was indicted into the Alpha Omega Alpha National Medical Honor Society, the Rare Diseases Hall of Fame, and the World Academy of Sciences. Dr. Theo Ritas has also helped develop some unique dietary supplements containing flavonoids for allergic and neuroinflammatory disorders. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Theo Ritas. Thank you so much for being here. And we're gonna do, be talking about interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome. Um, Let's get started by talking about how we diagnose interstitial cystitis, bladder pain. Well, first of all, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak with you and to all the people that will be listening. Uh, this condition uh, has been around for a long time, and unfortunately, we're still struggling to understand it and help basically manage uh, the symptoms, if not treat it. Um, as I'm sure most of uh, your listeners know, uh, patients present with symptoms that are very similar to a urinary tract infection, but urine cultures turn out to be negative. Uh, giving antibiotics blindly uh, for a few turns uh, don't really reduce or improve uh, the condition. So basically, if you have symptoms like a urinary tract infection that do not improve with anything for about three months, you have a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis in your bladder pain syndrome. Now, what is uh, also important to remember is that the symptoms may be different from person to person and may vary actually during the course of this condition as well. So about maybe 60% of the people have pain, but the pain might be more like pressure at the lower abdomen rather than acute pain. It might be pain in the bladder area, or pain associated with urination or intercourse, but not all of the patients present the same way. Also very important to remember that there are other symptoms that might be reminiscent of other potential diagnoses. So I would say about 40% of the people have either allergies or sensitivities to foods or other environmental uh, triggers. And invariably, either psychological or physiological stress can actually worsen or precipitate the symptoms. There have been many cases where individuals had some symptoms and then something horrendous happened like trauma, like surgery, uh, like God forbid someone dying in the family and all of a sudden the symptoms are kind of, you know, off uh, and, and they're just not manageable anymore. So it's very important that we address the individual as a whole and not focus only uh, on the bladder. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot, I mean, in, in my situation, because I, I have interstitial cystitis myself and I don't have the pain associated with it. So interesting, a, little, a lot of people will say, you know, it's a pelvic pain condition, but are there a lot of people who don't have the pain um, symptom and, you know, how would you, how would you address people in that category? Yeah, that is correct. And I, newer criteria try to separate those with pain with those without pain. Uh, at the end of the day, the approach, unfortunately, so far is about the same, although we can say a few words about the different uh, types a little later. Um, mm -hmm. But those that do have uh, pain, uh, might need different approaches in combination to address the pain. Uh, because once the pain starts, many times it becomes continuous. It's something like what we call phantom pain, uh, 
In other words, we might improve the condition in the bladder or elsewhere in the body, but the pain still remains. So mm -hmm. that uh, approach uh, will require different types of either supplements or drugs uh, to address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so would you say, uh, you know, are there, are there any other comorbidities like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia? Right. So for almost 20 years ago, when I had started working with my colleagues in this uh, syndrome, it was apparent that many of them have, as I said earlier, either allergies or sensitivities. We use a more general term. We call them atopic conditions. So if you have atopy or if you're an atopic individual, that means those immune cells called the mast cells are triggered not only by allergies, but by other conditions, pathogens, you know, stress, et cetera. And then more recently, it's become apparent that many have what we call myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome, or just chronic fatigue syndrome, and that many of those have fibromyalgia as well. So the presentation could be variable. Of course, if there is frequency of urination and nocturia, that focuses more on the bladder-related problems. But we've seen many patients who also have endometriosis, and the pain of endometriosis reflects on the bladder as well. That's what we call neuropathic pain. So the difference is, if you prick with your finger, you know, with a needle or a thorn, you know exactly where the pain is. With neuropathic pain, it can travel up and down your spinal cord about three levels. So you might have pain in the bladder and it feels in the abdomen. You might have endometriosis, but you feel the pain, you know, lower down. Uh, so it's very important, again, to recognize what other types of pathologies, quote unquote pathologies, there might be, because not everything will fit in one basket. And what I usually uh, recommend or try to do is address as many of what we understand, see what is left in terms of symptoms, because that might direct us to look for what might be going on elsewhere. So we might be missing, let's say, endometriosis. But if we address the endometriosis, maybe the other symptoms will get better as well, just as an example. Mm. What, what would you say would be the best approach with IC? Because I think a lot of people out there, um, you know, they'll go see a urologist and they won't really get the answers they're looking for. Would you say that, you know, a holistic approach to treatment would be best? Uh, I will try to avoid the word and, and I'll explain why, but it is very important to look at the person as a whole. Um, because as we've already discussed, there can be different symptoms that require different approaches. The reason I don't like particular terms and I lecture all the time to such groups is we have integrative medicine, we have functional medicine, we have holistic medicine. And many times these terms blend and, and overlap. And in my mind, they're not really very different from each other, even though we tend to use them differently. So in integrative medicine, let's say your own will also use dietary supplements rather than just drugs. Uh, in functional medicine, you know, we tend to think that there is a cause for what is going on that may not necessarily come from just one organ tissue. You know, in holistic, we obviously address the whole body. And, and as I said, they overlap. I think, first of all, it's very important to find any health professional who is willing to listen and look at you as a whole person. Because medicine has developed such that every specialty is very well defined for good reason, but also limiting itself to that organ or tissue. And as it's become apparent from what we've discussed so far, these symptoms basically overlap and therefore only a urologist might not be the best person to address this unless such a urologist is open-minded and willing to think past the bladder and talk to other colleagues as well. So number one is we have to make sure that the definition is correct because you might have what we call overactive bladder. There might be other reasons. Diabetic patients can have actually, you know, problems with the bladder as well. And so are other medical conditions. So we should make sure that we exclude those diagnoses that can be better defined, such as, as I said, diabetes, for instance, et cetera, uh, or 
Sometimes there is a small pituitary adenoma, a small benign tumor at the part of the brain that regulates all hormones, but the pituitary is posterior and anterior pituitary, and the posterior pituitary releases antidiuretic hormone. So if we don't have enough antidiuretic hormone, we'll be peeing like crazy, but that comes from, as I said, the pituitary. So one has to make sure that we exclude all of those, and then you're left with what we don't really understand, we call it interstitial cystitis. So that's number one. Number two is to try to understand what is it that we're treating. Because if it's pain, many times we just address the pain without knowing where it's coming from or you know the frequency of urination, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's important to try to focus, if it is the bladder, on what is happening in the bladder. And even though we don't exactly know what is happening in the bladder in interstitial cystitis, we definitely know three things. Number one, that the bladder lining that protects the bladder is somehow disrupted. We use terms like micropetechiae or glomerulations. We're talking about the same thing. There are cracks in the bladder. Mm -hmm. Number two, there is an inflammatory component in the bladder, meaning mm -hmm. for whatever reason, what is in the urine is irritating the bladder lining, and that inflammation makes those cracks worse so that they might end up being ulcers, what we call harness ulcers. And the third component is the nerves. The sensory nerves in the bladder and in the muscle called the detrusor muscle are activated. Mm -hmm. And as long as they're activated, they will continue to send pain messages that might be reflected in the whole of the pelvis or just the bladder. So we have to address the inflammation. We have to protect the bladder lining and reduce the firing of the nerves. That's the approach, at least in my mind. And there are mm -hmm. things we can do for each one of these components, and we should be addressing those rather than addressing only the pain, which will continue to be as long as the other two components are not actually addressed properly. Yeah, and there's also a lot of talk now where they're trying to shift away from you know, um, classifying it as a bladder condition and, and more so a pelvic pain syndrome. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, to some extent, that might be true because the pain, for those who feel the pain, is more generalized, not always in the bladder. So you don't want to leave those patients out. But by the same token, you have to make sure that we're not dealing with endometriosis, as I said, or some other condition that might be contributing to the pelvic pain. And I'll give you one example that's close to my heart. Two papers were published about a year ago in excellent journals. The primary paper was published in the journal of Nature, and then an editorial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they showed both in animals and in humans that if the mast cells are activated either in the intestine or in the bladder, they sensitize nerve endings, and the patients feel abdominal pain, even though the pain is not in the abdomen, but it comes from the intestine or the bladder. In this particular paper, it was intestinal problem. And we know that the mast cells are involved in the bladder. We were among the very first 25 years ago to show that there are more mast cells in the bladder in IC patients. And more importantly, they're more activated. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, the European urologist colleagues actually have bladder mastocytosis as one of the criteria for the diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, except that our colleagues in the United States shy away from biopsying the bladder from fear of perforating it, so we don't actually count the mast cells. Mm. But we know from such and many other studies from our laboratory and others that the mast cells are involved in what we call neuroinflammation. Mm -hmm. So they allow inflammation, then they release molecules that actually cause pain. And uh, mm -hmm. a couple of months ago, the Inter International Association of the Study of Pain at a conference in Toronto, and I was grateful that I was invited to talk about mast cells and pain. There's no question that the mast cells are involved in pain, regardless whether it's the bladder or elsewhere in the body. So that makes us think, therefore, can we block 
inflammation or neuroinflammation specifically, can we block the mast cells, whether it's elsewhere in the body as well as the bladder? And can we then either reduce the activity of the sensory nerves or at least minimize uh, their firing because we will be removing the triggers for the firing? Mm. Mm. Wow, that's... Um, this so I, I just wanted to to get a little bit of information out there on Elmeron. Um, I know that a lot of urologists are no longer prescribing it, but it is still being prescribed. Um, and if we can talk a little bit about Cystoprotec. Uh, sure. So uh, I, I was with my colleague, Granum Sand, who has long retired from Tufts University, he was chief of urology. Uh, we had participated in a number of uh, clinical trials funded by the National Institute of Health, actually. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, of course, everybody was excited about Elmiron or pentosan polyphosphate uh, uh, yeah. because it, it was felt that it was sort of covering the cracks in the bladder. Uh, but as it turns out, Elmiron was a very small molecule to begin with. And the first study that was published and was used for approval of Elmiro under the Orphan Disease Act in the United States. It wasn't really a very robust study. And subsequent studies actually did not even uh, repeat those uh, results. That doesn't mean to say that there might not have been some benefit uh, at that time. But as I said, it's a very small molecule. So the possibility of covering or lining the bladder was very small to begin with. And of course, in the last few years, uh, it's been published numerous times that those who have been on Elmiron, and the longer you've been on Elmiron, the worse, you get vision problems without going into the specifics. Some people have turned out actually almost getting blind. Um, mm -hmm. So starting as, as, as early as 20 years ago, we kind of said, what is it that makes up the protective layer of the bladder wall? And it is actually chondroitin and hyaluronate. Similar molecules are found actually in our joints as well. Uh, but they're made differently and their interaction in the bladder is a little different than, than in the joint. So we said, well, why don't we just use the natural molecules, chondroitin and hyaluronate, rather than giving something synthetic? So that was number one. Number two, since we know there's inflammation, can we include a natural molecule that is anti-inflammatory and we chose quercetin at the time. Quercetin continues to be very good anti-inflammatory. Even now, we can add something else, which is called luteolin, which is a little better. But let's stay with quercetin. So we put the three together. The difficulty is that chondroitin and quercetin are not absorbed very well from the gut. They're absorbed less than 10%. Chondroitin is a huge molecule, and quercetin has actually groups only that we call them hydroxy groups that makes it very difficult to be absorbed through cell membranes. So we did a whole bunch of experiments back then to combine these molecules with different oils. And we ended up deciding that olive pomace oil was the best and the cheapest. So after you take the olive oil, you're left with a pit. If you squeeze the pit, you get basically thicker oil. And we use that as salad dressing in Greece and Italy anyhow. Yeah. Uh, so what happens is if you take basically powder and you put it into any oil and you shake it, you basically give it energy or you mix it. You create little spheres. They're called liposomes. And the spheres trap the solutes, the powder, inside them. And that increases their absorption about five times from the gut. And that's why we mix them up with olive pomace oil, and therefore we created the Cystoprotec because all these ingredients are now in soft shell capsules or 50% of the capsule is the olive pomace oil and allows higher absorption. And there were many publications using either laboratory conditions or using animals and two clinical studies that showed the Cystoprotec was quite effective actually in some of the symptoms, you know, not all of the symptoms of the patients, uh, the pain was probably the hardest to address, but the frequency was getting better. And to some extent, the pain was lower as well. And it's quite interesting because a Canadian company, 
piggybacked on using the chondroitin, the hyaluronate, and they created a product that is actually given intravesically uh, for many patients. But it's invasive, obviously. But they use the same idea. Rather than hoping that it will be absorbed and that eventually reach the bladder, they can put it directly into the bladder. But they never use the quercetin part. So they were, the idea was to cover the lining intravesically, but they still didn't have anything to reduce inflammation. And there have been thousands of patients uh, over the last 20 years that have been using uh, the Cystoprotec. And you get better benefit if you now address some other symptoms at the same time. So for instance, those patients that had a history of atopy or allergic reactions, we recommended that they get an antihistamine at the same time. And one study that had been done had used the antihistamine called hydroxyzine or anorax. Mm -hmm. uh, but one can use other antihistamines. There's one antihistamine in Canada called rupatadine, uh, selling by the name of rupal, R-U-P-A-L-L, uh, which is not available in the United States, which is better than hydroxyzine or anorax because it's an antihistamine, but it blocks mast cells to some extent. And it also blocks another molecule called platelet activating factor or PAF that is involved in allergy and inflammation. So there you go. And then you left the fact that stress is horrible. So we have to reduce stress. Uh, yeah. So I usually recommend a herb called ashwagandha uh, mm -hmm. at about 500 milligrams you know, a day, which is fairly good and has been used in your inflammation as well before one goes mm -hmm. to prescription medications to reduce uh, stress. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, we stress that on, <laughs> no pun intended. Anybody has a chronic on. problem is likely to be stressed anyhow. So we're basically of spinning course. our wheels by not addressing uh, that. Yeah. A good, a good part, of, I apologize for interrupting you. A, a, no, no, it's okay. an, adi an additional benefit of the antihistamines, all of them, but as I said, Rupata did Rupal uh, better than that the others, is that any antihistamine is also slightly anticholinergic, yes. and the acetylcholine is what makes the bladder go. So when we give something that is anticholinergic, we reduce the frequency. So you're getting a, an additional benefit by using an antihistamine at the same time, whichever one, uh, for that reason as well. Yeah. I think um, a lot of patients, including myself, are on amitriptyline uh, Correct. as an anticholinergic. Yes, and, and amitriptyline is an antihistaminic as well. It has antihistaminic yes. activity. So you're talking the reverse, but yes, that's exactly right. Uh, one, one, one problem with the tricyclic antidepressants, such as amitriptyline or Elavil, is that for some people are quite sedating. Yes. And for some people you tend to gain weight. Uh, so you have to keep it between like 25 to 50 milligrams because the antidepressant dose is 75 milligrams or more. So yeah. we tend to stay lower than the antidepressant dose. Yes. And, and also taking it in the evening is the key. Correct. Um, if you want to wake up in the morning. Correct. <laughs> um, so in terms of, you know, Amitriptyline versus Adorax, um, what would you say is, is more beneficial? Um, I wouldn't say more beneficial because they have you know, diff different ways to look at them. Mm. Uh, clearly, Adorax at night is helpful because it can also put you in a deeper sleep and you mm. might actually reduce nocturia. We often use it for children that have enoresis, that you know, you're, they wet their bed uh, yeah. at night. So... I tend to start with hydroxyzine or Adorax before I go to Elevil. And if that doesn't work, then I might go to amitriptyline and then start at about 10 milligrams and keep on going higher up to about 50 milligrams to see where things are. An mm -hmm. additional benefit of amitriptyline is that there have been studies showing that it is also useful for neuropathic pain. So therefore, we might have the anticholinergic effect, we might have the antihistaminic effect, we might have the little sedating effect at night, but we also get the chronic neuropathic uh, benefit. Uh, mm -hmm. So, therefore, if one can tolerate it, I mean, triptyl might be even better than hydroxyzine. But as I said, I usually start with one and move to the other 
depending what the symptoms are, because if there isn't a lot of pain, there's no reason to potentially go to amitriptyline, uh, but maybe not. Someone might not have, you know, tolerated hydroxyzine. I, I couldn't tolerate for, personally, I couldn't tolerate the, the hydroxyzine. It, it just, it made it, it caused um, urinary retention. Um, if, if you overdo it, it will. And the combination of hydroxyzine and amitriptyline is likely to cause retention as well. Yeah. Because they're both anticholinergic. Yes, yes. So, so yeah. in other words, if someone has allergies or atopic problems, a tiny bit of hydroxyzine would be beneficial because mm -hmm. it's a stronger antihistamine uh, than not. Mm -hmm. But rupatadine or rupal would be even better than that because it also blocks the mast cells as mm -hmm. someone. If someone has more pain, then there might be reason to combine uh, the amitriptyline or go to amitriptyline to see how much you can reduce the pain. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a lot of people, you know, are, are really just struggling to get off Almiron. Would you say that using Cystoprotect can be somewhat of a parallel um, to, you know, like they can get off Almiron and feel confident that they can take Cystoprotect? And I absolutely uh, feel so. I mean, I didn't feel Elmer was doing anything to begin with. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't mean to be negative for my colleagues who use it. I mean, that was allowed, and therefore, why not use it type of thing. But as I said, the studies did not really uh, prove that it was effective. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of excitement at the beginning, but then, you know, as we moved on, it showed that it wasn't. And in fact, as I said, the ingredients in Sister Protect are the natural ingredients that the bladder uses to make up or correct the bladder lining. So from that point of view, there's absolutely no downside whatsoever. Um, what we don't know, because such studies have not been done for lack of funding, is how much one can take and how high you should go. But we've had numerous thousands of patients that during severe symptoms, they go up to two capsules three times a day, and then when symptoms subside, they can go back. And what is interesting is we've had many patients, including many health professionals, nurses, physicians, who had to give up you know, their work, and they went back and started working again. And mm -hmm. the way eliminated to protect entirely, they started having symptoms again. So they mm -hmm. tend to stay you know, like one or two a day when symptoms are very uh, mild. Okay. But we've had patients for 25 years taking it. It's absolutely no problem whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's nothing to worry about, uh, as, as I said. Yeah, and the great thing is yeah, you don't have to worry about, you know, things like retinal maculopathy. Of um, course not. Yes, thank God. You know, I, a lot of people being on, on medications long term can be detrimental to your health. Um, you know, I personally have been on amitriptyline for 20 years. And I'd like to get off because I've been on it for so long. And I know that Correct. there have been some studies showing cognitive decline um, when when you use it long term. So the nice thing about Cystoprotec is that you don't have to worry about all these things. And if it works for you, then it's Correct. Fine. You're right. There have been some studies that if one takes antihistamines or anticholinergics for a very long time, and the study was actually years, and it was done in individuals over 50, so we don't know what happens in younger people, it did show cognitive decline, which would not be surprising, number one, because we need acetylcholine to function. And in fact, the only drugs we have for Alzheimer's that don't work very well are those that allow acetylcholine to stay for a longer time in the brain, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, but histamine in the brain is known to be important for memory and learning and motivation. So we can't just overdo it. We can't just block uh, the action of the histamine in the brain by taking way too much antihistamines. And I take issue with some of my colleagues who prescribe antihistamines at like you know 150 milligrams. And as you probably know, a whole bunch of teenagers about a year and a half ago were actually overdosing on Benadryl, which is you know a common antihistamine, especially in the States. Uh, mm -hmm. And they ended up in emergency rooms almost comatose. And in fact, the Food and Drug Administration put uh, a black box warning about a year and a half ago that you cannot overdo it with antihistamines because they could have serious effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we just have to stay, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, below 100 milligrams, period, no matter what you use. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, so. yeah. Well, thank you. This has been very, very 
very enlightening and educational. I thank you so much for your time and coming, um, you know, to speak with us today. I think a lot of people will get great benefit from this. And um, if they have any questions, maybe we can, you know, provide a, an area where we can have comments and-, and Sure, I, I, it would be wonderful if you can get actually some comments or questions and maybe we can have a follow-up and I can answer uh, those. Yeah, uh, that would be- a, well, a parting message is that some of the drugs that are used for obvious reasons for pain, especially the opioid drugs, do stimulate the mast cells. So yeah. we might be spinning our wheels if we were to use opioids for pain, knowing that the mast cells in the bladder and elsewhere are likely to be activated. So we have to be a little careful what medications to use. Uh, one medication that is typically tolerated by patients who have also mast cell problems, such as mast cell activation syndrome, et cetera, is uh, tramadol. Uh, that's an opioid-like drug, but not exactly opioid. Uh, so that tends to be uh, okay. And codeine is a very mild opioid. So that is tolerated. But other opioids that are stronger uh, are just not tolerated by patients that have you know, muscle-related problems in the blood or elsewhere. So we just have to watch it. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that can't be a long-term solution. I, I, Yes, well, you know, if you have a lot of pain, obviously pain specialists are likely to use those drugs before mm -hmm. they do, you know, they can put, of course, you know, nerve stimulators and other approaches, which might be safest and maybe uh, more effective. But we usually go through those opioid-like drugs first. Uh, mm -hmm. But many colleagues are not aware of the fact that they trigger the mast cells. So we just have to be aware of uh, such drugs. Okay. Uh, and maybe, maybe one can try things like, you know, pregabalin, gabapentin, uh, or, you know, neurontin, uh, you know, et cetera, before you go to other, uh, you know, uh, approaches. Some of mm -hmm. those drugs tend to be helpful because they're used for what we call neuropathic pain. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, luckily you can increase the dosages. So for neurontin, for instance, you can start at 200 milligrams a day and you can go as much as 1600 milligrams. So you've got a leeway to, titrate uh, the dose and hopefully one can find a dose that is reasonable for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, okay, so we'll close off here. And uh, again, if people do have questions, maybe we, we will do a, a follow up. Um, we can do maybe like a live so that people can ask questions. Because um, I think probably there will be a lot of questions. Um, we Excellent. Did I'll, be I'll be very happy. Yeah, we should, we should actually organize a conference on interstitial cystitis in Canada. Oh, that would be uh, wonderful. Yeah, I, I think you can you can take that on actually, maybe two years okay. from now, not a year from now. Okay. Uh, but there are a number of uh, physicians who routinely reach out uh, to me and who do actually use Cystoprotect quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, so we could probably just uh, get them all together somehow. And you know, we might be able to find some funding to support such a conference. It shouldn't be. That would be, uh, you know, difficult for patients to attend. So, and we have in Toronto would be a great place for it. There we let's, go. Let's, let's go for it. Uh, let's I, it. I, I, might, I might find uh, some other associations that might be helpful. Uh, these are associations that just think of uh, health in general, not necessarily bladder health. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, they, they think about the patient as a whole, as we discussed. So they might be quite eager to to help okay. organize. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Okay, well, okay. that's so. Cool. Thank you very much. Have a great. <laughs> you too. Uh, great, great evening. You Bye. Too. Thank you.